Uh, good morning, everyone. So today uh, I first welcome Dr. Thirumala Kanagendi, uh, uh, popularly known Thiru. Uh, so uh, she is currently uh, vice chair of Department of Immunology at St. Jude's and also director of Center of Excellence in Innate Immunity and Inflammation at St. Jude's Research Hospital. So uh, it's a very inspiring journey and it's very fascinating journey uh, of her. It started from uh, Hyderabad only, uh, probably more before Hyderabad, I'll say Telangana. Uh, it's Kotha Gudam. Kotha Gudam. <laughs> okay, so her bachelor's are from there, from master's and PhD she has done from Osmania University. And there she studied about the plant pathogen and fungal toxins. Okay, so that's what she started with. And she did her postdoctoral, if I'm wrong, please. Uh, <laughs> so her first postdoctoral fellowship is from the University of Wisconsin and Ohio State University. Uh, again, she studied about fungal genetics and plant immunology and uh, innate immunity. Then uh, the things which really started in mammalian innate immunity is from University of Michigan. That's what <laughs> Wikipedia tells. <laughs> Okay, so after that, she joined as a, in a St. Jude's as an assistant member in, in, immunology, in department. immunology department. Where she focused on the studying inflammasomes and cell death, uh, she joined in 2007, and then she was promoted to the full member in 2013. She became vice chair of the immunology department in 2016, and was endowed with the Rosemary Thomas endowed chair in 2017. In 2022, she also became a director of Center of Excellence in Innate Immunity and Inflammation and Cell Shields. So, so she got she got many awards and fellowships, and uh, the notable is fellow. She is a fellow of American Association of Advancement of Science, where the science publications happens, and the fellow in uh, American Academy of Microbiology and American Society of Microbiology is. She is uh, definitely the highly, highly cited researchers, uh, means in the web of science from 2017 to 2022, uh, means till last year, and definitely this year uh, will she will be. And the major contributions is she published multiple study where uh, the, which lead to the discovery of NLRP3 inflammasomes. You all know about probably about the NLRP3 inflammasomes and how these inflammasomes work, how they trigger, how the different signal triggers these inflammasomes and how the component of inflammasomes are assembled uh, come from her studies, uh, uh, work part of that studies come from her lab only. And uh, recently, very recently, uh, uh, maybe if, maybe five, six years back, she gave a term which is called penoptosomes and pen, pen apoptosis, which is uh, another thing which she's going to talk, so I'm not going to take more time. And uh, uh, that's uh, what she is probably uh, going to talk today also. So I welcome Dr. Uh, Thiru on this stage. You can hear me. So first, I would like to thank uh, Santosh and uh, CCMB for having me here. It's my great pleasure uh, always to come back and discuss uh, the work that we have been doing. So today I'm going to talk about innate immunity, our first line of defense against anything that we encounter. You know, right now, there's so many microbes around us. We are constantly being attacked by uh, different pathogens, be it viruses, fungi, bacteria, and then how do we defend against those pathogens that we get exposed to? Or a lot of things have been, you know, will be happening in our, uh, you know, within the body, be it inflammation or exposure to uh, certain uh, metabolites, which would, could be harmful to our system. So innate immune system has to constantly patrol or like, you know, do the internal threats as well as internal threats and mountain immune response. So we are today, we are in this state, you know, maybe maintaining homeostasis. It's all because of our innate immune system. So first, um, I would like to thank 
all my former group members for the dedication uh, that led to all these discoveries. And uh, I'm so happy to see Keshav uh, here today. And where is he here? Maybe. Yeah, Keshav, thanks for coming. And uh, they're all leading their labs around the world. They have become uh, group leaders, faculty members. Uh, and all of the work that I'm I'm going to talk about is based on their dedication, their contribution, and I also thank my current uh, lab members. Uh, and I'm going to talk about one story that was by Bala and uh, Kannan. So thanks to my colleagues and my very, you know, like um, small journey, global journey. I first started in Kottagudam, uh, a small town in Telangana. As a child, I was always curious about microbes and then why some people get disease and others do not. And then after completing my master's, uh, I started in a virology lab at Ikrisat studying viruses, plant viruses uh, as a research technologist and then got inspired to do PhD and got into Osmania University Microbiology Department and also you know, jointly with DFID in the UK. So Ikrisat, Osmania University Microbiology Department, that's where I started understanding you know, uh, plant pathogens or microbes and um, got a fellowship during my PhD to go to Scotland to study really the viruses, like how they infect plants. And I was having a discussion with our director here. If you're good at molecular biology, I think we can do anything. Biochemistry and molecular biology is foundational. We can switch fields, we can do whatever. So there I studied uh, plant viruses and fungi, trying to understand diagnostics, develop diagnostics and treatments. And from there, one of our collaborators gave me an op opportunity to do postdoc in her lab at University of Wisconsin Madison. So there I went on to do yeast genetics, you know, to understand basic uh, fundamentals of uh, growth and development and also toxin production. Uh, and then from there I moved on to plant innate immunity and then to Michigan to do as you know Santosh was telling. Uh, as soon as mammalian innate immune sensors were discovered, I shifted uh, fields. And then after finishing three postdoctoral uh, fellowships, I went to St. Jude uh, randomly. By then, I already got faculty positions at three more places. But then when I went to St. Jude, Dr. Peter Doherty, Nobel laureate in immunology, he interviewed me for the faculty position. And by the end of our interview, he gifted me this book, The Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize. And he said, you know, Thiru, uh, you must come to Memphis. You know, I hope to see you in Memphis. So then I took it back to my family and said, you know, Peter said to come. So let's go to Memphis. And uh, of course, it's uh, history now. I built an independent research program at St. Jude. Thanks to Peter for motivating me, for uh, for inspiring me to join St. Jude. And then for the last two decades, these are two fundamental questions we have been asking. Like, how do we sense pathogens? As we just discussed, every second, every minute, we are being exposed to all these microbes and pathogens. So how do we defend ourselves against pathogens? And then as soon as pathogens are there, if our cells get infected, we should decide whether our cells you know, like should live or die because we cannot have a replicating pathogen, a replicating virus infecting our cell. So sometimes it would be harmful to kill a cell or be beneficial depending on a pathogen. There's a wide range of uh, exciting, fascinating stuff that goes on within the cell. So these are the two questions that we've been addressing. And regarding translation, it's all about health and disease. We maintain homeostasis because we maintain like an innate immunity and cell death. And if our inner wiring doesn't work properly, that leads to systemic inflammation, morbidity and mortality. So these are the fundamental questions. There's a lot needs to be understood at learn. And we are still like, you know, we're uh, having this journey ongoing and a lot of uh, discoveries have been happening uh, in this field. So as we discussed, as soon as we get infected, our innate immune system get activated inflammation will be induced inflammation is a prerequisite to to kill you know again infected cells and once pathogen is cleared the resolution state should happen if there is no resolution for inflammation that's when all these diseases happen so inflammation is a predisposing factor for uh, you know cancers for inflammation in gi tract i've been hearing a lot about uh, you know gi cancers in india uh, in even in uh, people who are in their 30s so neurodegenerative diseases uh, mental health issues uh, because of inflammation in brain neuronal cells uh, and then 
regular diseases like arthritis, diabetes, atherosclerosis, all of these different diseases have basic roots into innate immunity and cell death. So from there, the outline, uh, very brief outline, as soon as our cells, innate immune cells that patrol our body to find any danger or threat, they sense pathogens or pathogen associated molecular patterns you know, like the small components of pathogens or damage associated molecular patterns, because when they infect, they cause damage uh, to, to cells. So all these things can be sensed by innate immune sensors that are present on the cell surface or in the cytosol. So once the sensor sense any danger or a pathogen, they assemble these multi-protein complexes, you know, uh, cell death complexes that kill cells. And this cell death is essential for release of cytokines, maybe you heard a lot of, uh, you know, the cytokines, some are uh, good, some are bad cytokines, and depending on the context, they play a very important role in immune response. So this is a very simplistic view. But then if you look at pathogens, there are wide range of pathogens. They have different lifestyles. You know, even if you take viruses, they have different, different lifestyles, and some carry uh, proteins to inhibit our uh, system. So we have to be very smart to be able to understand how sneaky or how intelligent those pathogens are. So the immune system is alert and identify there is a threat. So again, you know, these pathogens carry their own different lifestyles. We need to be able to sense those pathogens. And also, if one of our nucleic acid editing enzyme, like ADR1, doesn't work, then the nucleic acids will be accumulated in the in the cell, and that's again uh, a threat. So we should be able to understand that there is accumulation of nucleic acid. So the system is not working. So then again, you know, like danger signals, homeostatic alterations, one metabolite is produced in excess, another metabolite is in low levels. So how do you maintain? It's all really fascinating. And then different cell types in our body express different sensors. So neutrophils, uh, you know, macrophages. Macrophages are innate immune cells that are there to, to sense anything, you know, around our body. And there are different classes of innate immune sensors because they all have unique jobs to perform. Uh, and then they activate distinct uh, pathways tailored upon what do we sense and what proteins are involved. And then cell death complexes are formed. And then all of these would have implications towards infectious diseases, inflammatory diseases, neuroinflammation or cancer, because mutations in any of these sensor molecules, like, you know, these proteins will lead to several of these diseases. So just having one alteration, then we have problems. So overall, it's all about health. If we do not understand innate immune system or cell death, we cannot control infections or cytokine storms or cancer, inflammation, metabolic aging, everything and anything you think of, they have links. So today I'm going to try to just explain a bit about uh, the overall picture of what we do in the lab. So as we discussed, so can we discuss later on? Uh, it might be better because I have to, uh, it's a long story that I have to cover now. So mutations at every step of your innate immune system is linked to disease. And there are different family members, right? So there are toll like receptors, or sensors on the cell surface, and there are other sensors in the cytosol within the cell, and they all activate different pathways. As we discussed, nf kappa b and MAP kinase, you might have heard about those pathways. They are triggered by toll-like receptors. And then the rest of these sensors are in the cytosol. Some sense RNA viruses, some sense DNA, and other sense uh, multiple things, including like, you know, wide range of things uh, are sensed by nod-like receptors. So for today's talk, I'll focus on this family, which is nod-like receptor family. And they've been discovered based on plant resistant genes. So plants have, plants not have blood, but they have immune system, right? So they should be able to recognize pathogens. They get infected too by, by viruses, fungi and whatnot. So they should restrict uh, pa pathogen growth by inducing cell death. So this was a basic fundamental towards understanding mammalian uh, immune system. So in plants, as soon as they sense, they restrict pathogen by inducing this cell death. And this is my own, you know, uh, from my own study back three decades ago, I think, uh, but still really applicable in what we uh, uh, understand today about immune system. So you can see here plant NLR family members. They're highly conserved. 
So that's why it's okay to understand innate immunity in flies, on uh, zebra fish or whatever, because these NLRs are highly, highly conserved. They have a central NAC domain for oligomerization and uh, internal protein uh, domains are very important. They have card or pyrin domains that are important to form these multi-protein complexes uh, because transcription analysis doesn't work here. We need to understand protein function, which is by cleavage of proteins. So that's where it goes. Transcriptional and translational regulation is what plays an important role here. So there are 22 uh, NLR family members in humans, whereas 13 uh, mice. And then when we first began studying this NLR family, they just were discovered. And we do not know anything about it, except there are people with mutations in NLRs that leads to several diseases, including this patient here. So this patient, because of mutations in NLRP3, they develop this uh, joint deformities, they have learning problems, they have period, periodic fever syndromes. That means all of a sudden they develop fevers without any obvious infection. So we thought to select this gene to study because of its link to disease. Uh, so that's where we began our journey, trying to understand the role of NLRP3. So this is the outline. First, I'm going to talk about NLRP3, the discovery of NLRP3, and then uh, how trying to understand NLRP3 led us to discover uh, the other sensors and other uh, complexes, and then the relevance you know, to human health at the end. So first, as, a, as we discussed, this manuscript published in 2001 was the inspiration for us, because at that time, we did not even know NLR nomenclature, not like receptor family members were not even discovered. They said, in these patients, there is a mutation in a putative pyrin-like protein, which is nothing but NLRP3 now. It causes FMF, like familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome and a muckle well syndrome. So as we discussed, they develop joint problems, they have skin problems, they have learning difficulties, but we do not know the pathway. Why these patients are developing these symptoms is not known, except for the mutation. So we always think about from patients, you know, from patients, we need to understand the symptoms and then understand the fundamental mechanisms and go back with therapeutics. This is always the circle we try to follow. So we are now have patients, they have mutations in NLRP3. Now the question is, what is NLRP3 doing? So we searched uh, for a lot of signaling pathways, a lot of microbes that can activate uh, this pathway. And after screening uh, in an unbiased way, we found that certain microbial components can activate NLRP3. That means NLRP3 can form a multi-protein complex with uh, the adapter protein ASC and caspase 1. Caspases are uh, really cool, coolest molecules on earth, I can say. They form multi-protein complexes. And this complex is essential for the maturation of the cytokines, IL-1, beta, and IL-18. These cytokines are there in a pro form, like in an inactive form, for them to become active and induce fevers they need to be cleaved by caspase 1. So the, the, even the smallest doses of these cytokines can induce high fevers in the body. So it, we are trying to understand fever-inducing molecules here, and we were able to identify that NLRP3 forming a complex is essential. And just a few years before, Dr. Yark Chop, he was the one who gave the term inflammasome to this multi-protein complex. He said a platform that triggers activation of inflammatory caspases for the processing of IL-1 beta is called inflammasome. But he used in those days, uh, you know, a cell-free system in a tube. He was able to overexpress and then uh, show that proteins are interacting or binding. These days, it wouldn't work. These days, we cannot just name a complex like that. But those days, it was okay. And still, the term is so uh, elegant in, in the way it explains inflammation, inflammation, so like complex. So that's a very beautiful term that he gave. And then we were searching for what is the physiological relevance of this complex. We were able to show that certain microbial components can activate, but what is its real meaning? So is there any pathogen that can engage this complex? So we searched, I mean, again, microbial components to us, it's not a pathogen. We have to have a full understanding that a pathogen can liberate uh, LPS, right? It can shed LPS, it can bore pores on the membrane, uh, of cells with type 3 secretion systems. It has flagellin that can alert immune system and it can uh, also, you know, throw toxins, uh, like liberate toxins into the cytosol. And when bacteria are getting damaged, their nucleic acids also get exposed, their cell membrane get exposed. So a lot of different uh, 
pathogen associated molecular patterns or dams can be released and by just looking at lps it doesn't mean much so that's what we always think it's like blind uh, men and elephant if you try to focus on one thing because here this person is looking at a tail and thinking that it's a rope that's exactly how we, we are obsessed with one thing and not thinking about the big picture uh, about so we were searching for real world infections so we searched and then we've identified influenza virus. So if you add influenza virus uh, to any cells, we found that it's engaging this NLRP3 inflammasome. And influenza virus is inducing maturation of ILON beta LAT. And this is the first time we're able to show that a live pathogen can engage this inflammasome complex. And then at that time, we were also trying to understand because of patients. These patients have joint problems and all sorts of problems. So uh, MRK and Zaki were interested in understanding different infectious diseases. So we developed cancer models, colon cancer models in the lab. And Zaki was trying to understand the role of NLRP3 in cancer setting. And Rinki came from uh, Nijmegen, uh, like in you know, a Wanganin University. He was interested in understanding metabolic disorders. So he, he was establishing metabolic disease models in the lab and, okay. and he was establishing joint inflammation t-cell mediated auto-inflammatory diseases and all those different uh, models so any model that we established in the lab we used to see a phenotype for nlrp3 and that was giving nightmares to us we were really scared thinking that is this an artifact why in the world one molecule can be playing such an important role so we generated a new mouse line and we again confirmed and the data is the data there's absolutely no problem indeed nlrp3 is playing an important role, but how important depends on the context. So these studies, I think in, we're able to establish NLRP3, importance of NLRP3 and push the field forward. And uh, you might ask if it is so important, what is what about therapeutics? Are there any therapeutics targeting NLRP3? And indeed, you can see every company you can, uh, you know, your favorite company, Pfizer or Eli Lilly or whichever you think, they're all are invested in developing inhibitors of inflammasome pathway. This is the back in 2001 and 2021. So they're all focused, major, major companies are investing in studying these molecules now. So, so far we are able to show that influenza virus is the trigger for the formation of complex. But then whenever in immunology, we always think about a receptor and the ligand. But NLRP3 is involved in sensing a lot of stuff. So it's, it cannot be a receptor. So there must be another receptor upstream of NLRP3 channeling towards NLRP3. So we were started. We started searching for the upstream receptor of NLRP3 that is driving this inflammation and all of that. And then also another important aspect is is NLRP3 involved in killing cells because if influenza virus is infecting cells, our cells must be killed so that the replicative niche is killed, removed. So these were the two questions that we were asking. And the fascinating, you know, uh, it's all about life and death um, and never ending excitement here. A lot is not known. Maybe you heard about apoptosis. Historically, that's the only very well studied cell death uh, pathway and that's immunologically silent. So for our digits to become like, like this, we need apoptosis, which is immunologically silent death pathway that happens for homeostasis all the time but then there is other aspect of cell death that is happening which is inflammatory cell death that is really the key for a lot of infectious diseases you know so here you can see cells dying in a very quiet way they disappear but then in lytic death you can see the cells are dying in a very violent way liberating all the content cytokines alerting our immune system alerting our body inducing fevers to say that there is danger here we need to control the danger so uh, then for inflammatory cell death or apoptotic cell death, there's machinery. And the coolest molecules, as we discussed, are caspases. So there are only few caspases, overall 14, you know, maybe caspases, but they dictate life and death again. And they are classified into two major categories. One is inflammatory caspases, and the other one is apoptotic caspases. So this is very important to understand because inflammatory caspases are only very few, like caspase 1 caspase 11 in mouse and then the rest are all most probably you know classified into apoptotic caspases they execute or they initiate this non-inflammatory cell death so this is our understanding of caspases 
So, and then this is apoptotic pathway, intrinsic and extrinsic way, caspase 9 and 8, activate this apoptotic non-lytic death via caspase 3 and 7. So, 3 and 7 are executioners, 8 and 9 are initiators, and this is non-lytic. So, here you see caspase activation happens, but then there's no inflammasome, uh, and then no RIP3 being involved. And then the other pathway we discussed, innate immune inflammasome dependent death, which is uh, a pyroptosis, where inflammatory caspases are important. So caspase 1 is essential. So here caspases are important, but inflammasome is there, IL-1 beta is induced. So these are two main pathways. And then there's another pathway called necroptosis that happens in certain conditions where if viruses carry inhibitors to block host responses, that's when in a very unique fashion, uh, this pathway happens. And necroptosis is independent of caspases because we don't need caspases activation here. So these are three main categories. Let's forget about non-lytic, non-inflammatory apoptotic pathway, and let's focus on the lytic pathway, which is innate immune driven, which is pyroptosis, okay? So that brings to the next question. We started off asking, what is the substrate of caspase 1? Because caspase 1 itself cannot bore pores on the membrane, right? So membrane pores are required for membrane to lyse. So we were searching for the substrate of caspase 1 at that time. And then uh, in our proteomics study, we identified that caspase 7 is cleaved by caspase 1. So if you see here, in the absence of caspase 1, there's no caspase 7 activation. So these are the cleaved means activation. This suggests that caspase 1 is required for caspase 7. Very weird because 7 is apoptotic molecule, non-lytic. And then to confuse more, MRK showed even PARC1, the apoptotic pathway downstream molecule, is also getting cleaved. And this is now uh, triggered by innate immune uh, molecules like PAM3 or LPS. Didn't make any sense. But what is that we are seeing is we are breaking the dogmas in the field. We are showing that this inflammatory caspases can also engage or cleave these apoptotic caspases. So genetic, we are showing genetic evidence for the role of innate immunity or inflammasome or inflammatory caspases in linking with uh, apoptotic caspases. So here is against the dogma, breaking the rules, we were showing that this caspase 1, core component of inflammasomes, can cleave caspase 7 and PARC1. So what's next? I think uh, we went back to search for the receptor. What is the receptor upstream of NLRP3? And Prejwal, who is now an associate professor at University of Iowa, he pretty much screened every bug or every pathogen that you could think of and every single molecule, so-called sensor that might be involved to figure out what is this question mark, you know? So he, after screening all those uh, things, he found caspase 8 to be upstream. It was like we were in shock pretty much because caspase 8 is an apoptotic molecule. It's not even an innate immune sensor. How in the world that caspase 8 could be upstream of this? But the data was black and white because if you delete caspase 8, there is no inflammasome activation, no IL-1 beta IL-18 secretion, black and white data. So against the dogma, we put caspase 8 upstream. So this is providing the first genetic evidences, you know, for the role of caspase caspases, apoptotic caspases in innate immune pathway. Uh, and then John at that time was very interested in uh, looking at his patients and understanding why in the world is NLRP3 mutations are causing these joint problems. So we developed a mouse model called uh, I mean, chronic osteomyelitis disorder. Uh, these mice, these are foot pads of mice. When they're born, they're normal. But as they age, they completely destroy, like, you know, bone is destroyed. We don't have to do anything. Just leave the mice there and their joint destruction all over. So then John was able to delete IL-1 beta in this backdrop and then showed that if you delete this one single cytokine, there's complete blockade from this bone destruction. Amazing. Uh, you know, therapeutically, it's, it's going to be a miracle. Uh, so, and then upstream of IL-1 beta is our inflammasome, right? For IL-1 beta cytokine to do this damage, we need our inflammasome. And NLRP3 caspase 1 are the most important culprits we always think of. John thought, okay, I'll cross my mice with uh, NLRP3 knockout mice, caspase 1 knockout mice. I'm done. I can publish my story and move on. But things doesn't work. Uh, and each cross takes, by the way, six months to one year uh, to fully back cross. And he was able to show that in spite of deleting this most famous NLRP3, deletion did not protect. 
and caspase 1, a dedicated caspase for towards IL-1 beta, the only protease known in the world to cleave IL-1 beta is not involved. So now we are like, you know, in this uh, crazy uh, periods of time thinking that what could be the protease cleaving IL-1 beta? Uh, is it true? Anyway, so it, we, we have done so many crosses thinking that elastases, calpanes, catepsins, proteases, all of these things could be important, but lots of negative data. So we shifted our focus to caspase 8 because Prejwal was also showing involvement of caspase 8. So we also crossed these uh, CRMO mice with caspase 8, thinking that deletion of caspase 8 would be pro providing protection, but not. Caspase 3 deletion, caspase 7 deletion, nothing. So that shows that apoptotic molecular deletion is also not providing protection. And the other pathway is necroptosis. So we deleted MLKL, the executioner didn't work, rib case didn't work. So nothing pretty much didn't work. So we did a crazy experiment thinking that maybe in vivo, there are redundancies in the system so that we, we survive. In the, in the end of the day, for the most part, we live, right? So to, in order to be able to survive, there must be redundancies built in the system. So we thought if caspase 1 is not there, maybe other caspase is doing this job. So we made this cross, which is deleting both caspase 1, caspase 8 together with ripk 3 That means Caspase 8 is cleaving IL-1 beta in the absence of caspase 1. So caspase 1 is doing this job in the absence of caspase 8. So this can be only tested in in vivo condition because in vitro cells doesn't show this phenotype. So uh, this suggested that we have to be open-minded and understand disease, the complexity of diseases, complexity that happens in vivo and redundancies that are built in so that we are surviving today, you know, in spite of all these uh, infections or other conditions. So all in all, Prejwal showed caspase 8 is upstream of this inflammasome. And then John put it right next to in a redundant fashion. But then, you know, it's so exciting to see. NLRP3, we published even a paper saying that NLRP3 is not involved in bone destruction. But then when we crossed with caspase 8 rip 3 then it was protecting. So if we can replace caspase 1 with NLRP3 in this back cross. So NLRP3 is doing that job in a redundant fashion with caspase 8 and rip 3 So again, if we say that some molecule doesn't have a function, it doesn't mean it doesn't. So we need to find the other partner that's you know, joining forces to drive a phenotype. So all in all, I think we showed the importance of redundancies in vivo. And that's again brings to this uh, point breaking the rules. These were the rules set for apoptotic pathway, pyroptotic pathway, necroptotic pathway. What we are showing is that there is cross connectivity, cross talk that's happening between these pathways. Unless we understand this, we cannot find cures. That's the bottom line. So uh, we showed RIPK3, NLRP3, caspase 8. This is a cross that provided protection. So, and then John was also interested in skin diseases. For the most part, all skin conditions are treated with corticosteroids only. Even till today, there's no targeted therapy. And there are also wounds formed that there's no targeted therapy. We just dosed, get dosed up with steroids. Okay, So we were trying to understand if there is a molecular pathway to, uh, to be able to block this inflammation, skin inflammation. Of course, we started with uh, deleting IL-1 beta and IL-18, the downstream executioner cytokines. So John showed that it's not IL-1 beta in this case. Again, somehow beta is for bones, IL-1 alpha is for skin. And it's been 50 years since the discovery of IL-1 alpha. Still today, we do not know much about it, like whether it uh, functions from the membrane or a lot of fascinating biology around the cytokine. Still, we do not know a lot. Anyway, in this condition, IL-1 alpha was the problem. So then we started asking which sensor is important, which caspase is important, what is the pathway. Uh, so that's what we tried here. So. This data suggests that it's not caspase 1 and LRP3, it's not pyroptosis, it's not a protic pathway, it is not necroprotic pathway. What is this pathway? The cross caspase 1, caspase 8, if you remember, that was the one that's protecting from bone. Here it's not. So it's another one. We screened, you know, we made all these knockouts, single knockout, double knockout, triple knockout, quadruplicate knockout, deleting four genes in a mouse. You know, <laughs> that's what we have to do. Uh, the bottom line is, here in this case, it's RIPK1. It's not RIPK3. So RIPK1 together with caspase 8 and RIP3 is providing protection. So what do we call this ptosis? We didn't uh, dare to give the term uh, panoptosis at the time. It was six years before, six or close to a decade, I think. Uh, we were 
used to say that whatever a process, this whatever a process is important in driving these diseases. But we know the molecules or molecular signatures that are important. And then uh, overall, we made this whole nice, uh, you know, so-called pathways. We messed it up totally. We said, you know, we can't have this straightforward thinking. You know, we have to be uh, having uh, aerial view. Uh, so all in all, none of the established cell death models explain inflammatory diseases we are seeing. Uh, but then unless we understand what are the sensors, what are the caspases, what is the executioner, what are the cytokines, we cannot find therapies. So we need to understand and none of the models were uh, applicable and we were breaking all the rules. I think making all the big shots in the field upset and mad, uh, but we, you know, we went on. And my favorite is Dr. Box. Dr. Box says, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. We have to be open minded. So we need to ask if a model is good enough for a particular application or not. So we don't have to believe uh, even you know, think Keshavar, they were all in the lab. They were so hesitant. They were thinking, what is Thiru doing? You know, she's coming up with this crazy uh, idea because I think by nature, we always want to follow. We don't even uh, dare to, to give new terms or think outside the box, you know, it has to be following this way or that that way. But the data was telling, data was the, the giving us confidence, you know, for us. And always, yeah, I'm from the plant field originally. Barbara is my like, you know, uh, mentor, not direct but indirect mentor. She always says, if you know you're on the right track, if you have this inner knowledge from inner knowledge comes from, of course, you know, what we see, right? What we experience. No one can turn you off, no matter what they say. Uh, so our model is follow the genetic data, subject to really rigorous testing, obtain multiple lines of evidence, and free from any bias or, or preconceptions. So if you have that kind of solid confidence, then no one can stop you. No one can, you know, they can say whatever they want. So I think this was the stage set up for the new frontier in innate immunity cell death field. We think we join two fields together. We want to say innate immune cell death, you know, not even innate immunity and cell death. It's one field, innate immune cell death. But then, uh, so those were the days where we were forming the foundation, like, you know, filling in the gaps. The next we'll uh, talk about, is there a sensor for that? So if you remember the scheme, we have infections and then the sensors, the cell death complexes, that are leading uh, cells to die in the liberating cytokines. Cytokines are causing the severe inflammatory diseases, correct? So now the question is, NLRP3, as we discussed, it cannot be the direct sensor. In prejudicial search, we found caspase 8. Caspase 8 is not a sensor. So what is a sensor? Even after a decade, still we are asking the same question, what is a sensor? So uh, at that time, Tenima came into the lab with expertise in viruses. So. Uh, she screened 200 different knockout strains, whatever we had in the lab at that time. She screened and she found that ZBP1 at that time, we had no idea what ZBP1 was. Uh, so she added influenza virus to these cells. Of course, they will die. IAV is influenza virus. They kill cells. All red cells are dead cells. And if you don't have ZBP1, one single molecule, absolutely there is no death. You can add a lot I think uh, Kesha was also involved in those studies. You can add whatever dose of virus, cells do not feel it at all. They can just, you know, be there. And then here we know that influenza virus activates caspase 1. And this caspase 1 activation, our 2006 study showed NLRP3 is required for this cleavage. And then ZBP1 is totally phenocopying NLRP3. And then ZBP1 is also required for iron beta, right? So we could call this complex or this pathway as ZBP1 inflammasome because it's activating caspase 1 alpha beta, but we couldn't because cell death is there, you know, like we need to sort out whether pyroptosis is important. So we asked if ZBP1 induced death is pyroptosis. That means we asked if caspase 1 is required. Gasder means the pore forming molecules are required, but none of these pyroptotic molecules are required. This is so strange. So ZBP1 is activating NLRP3 inflammasome for the maturation of hyaluron beta, but not for cell death, right? So then we are asked apoptotic pathway is important. Is it necroptosis? What is it? What is the complex? What is the sensor? And then this is the complex that John discovered for bone disease. The same cross. If you don't have caspase 1 together with caspase 8 and ribk 3 there's complete protection from the cell death. Again, this whatever optosis, we didn't give the name. 
Then we were asking, what is a sensor? Of course, ZPP1 is a sensor. So overall, the story is ZPP1 via RIM domain. It has a RIM, beautiful RIM domain that can form a complex with RIPK molecules and then engage caspase 8 via DD. So there's this protein-protein interactions complex formed. Once this complex is formed, there's simultaneous activation of caspase 1 and the other. That's why there are redundancies in the system. So uh, here is a sensor. Influenza virus is sensed by ZBP1 via its Z-alpha, Z-beta domains. Uh, when nucleic acid is released, of course, upon influenza infection. ZBP1 activates NLRP3. NLRP3 forms a complex with these caspases, induces peroptosis, liberating cytokines, and that's the... Uh, so overall, it took us a decade. You know, we started with NLRP3. We showed NLRP3 is important in activating inflammasome, caspase 1. We showed influenza virus is the specific trigger that can engage this complex. And in our search for what is the upstream molecule, we discovered ZBP1 as an innate immune sensor of uh, this influenza virus triggering NLRP3. I think this is a beautiful, uh, like, you know, one of the landmark uh, studies uh, where you can see, you know, Keshvi is also there. Uh, it's a very exciting story for us. And people used to ask us, challenge us a lot. Does it happen in single cells? You know, like, is this complex real? Because we are saying multiple molecules are coming together. So we were able to show that indeed ASK, you know, beautifully co-localizes with caspase 8 and RIPK3 and specs are formed. As soon as cell is infected with influenza virus, this uh, multi-protein complexes as forms the platform, a spec is formed. Uh, once the spec is formed, cell will be dead. So we are showing that these molecules can be together. But this evidence, there could be artifacts. So we wanted another line of evidence. And then, uh, you know, um, Yachu in the lab used this expansion microscopy technique. And he was able to show beautiful co localization of the components of pyroptosis, which is ASC with that of caspase 8, with that of RIP3, and that this spec is formed. So influenza induced this panoptosome complex is formed. And then that led us to uh, talk about panoptosis and the definition of, uh, let me see. So panoptosis means it's innate immune cell death because innate immune sensors are involved and then regulated by panoptosomes, multiprotein complexes beyond inflammasomes. And it includes caspases and ribcase. So which caspase, which ribk depend on the, the trigger, which virus is engaging this pathway. So sometimes it could be caspase 1, caspase 8, ribk 1. This could be multiple combinations, as I showed you. Uh, and then in the beginning days, it was very tough. But now there are a lot of similar studies for all of this. ZPP1, there are a ton of uh, work being done by followed up on our initial study. And for panoptosis, it's just being three, four years and already 230 manuscripts suggesting that it is filling in an important field, important gap in the field and helping to identify therapeutic targets. And that's what we care about for the most part. So it's fascinating. And then uh, in real world infections, is where we see these complexes apply. If you just go with LPS, it doesn't require or no, this uh, complexity, right? So now we discovered ZBP1 as a panoptosome sensor. How do we discover other sensors? So how do we discover new sensors? That means we need to identify pathogen mimics or pathogens, right? So we screen for a lot of different pathogens uh, to, and then screen from the host. So host molecules, pathogen molecules, and that, that's the combination of hundreds of things to identify the sensor, the complex, and pore forming molecules. And it's a wrong story short. During most of hemolytic diseases, inflammatory conditions, heme is released, you know, like in the system. Uh, heme alone doesn't induce cell death. So Bala and Kannan showed that heme together with bacterial components, you know, our microbiome can be liberated. Sometimes our other infections can contribute to this. So it will become detrimental to have heme in combination with other pathogens or other taps. So there's robust cell death induced upon these combinations. Of course, they, as I said, they were screening for 200 different combinations. Out of those, they found this particular combination of heme PAM3 or uh, LPS, inducing death. And then we were able to discover that NLRP12 is the sensor of heme plus PAMs. So we now have another uh, NLRP12. The beauty of NLRP12 is they, there are patients with mutations in NLRP12. We couldn't identify why, uh, why they are uh, developing this inflammatory diseases. Now we can understand going backwards and understanding that NLRP12 is a problem. And then now therapeutic companies are all after NLRP12 to identify inhibitors uh, for this part. So 
again, mutations leads to all sorts of auto-inflammatory diseases. So in the real world infections, how can we apply the knowledge of innate immunity and cell death? And uh, I'll just give two examples and I will finish there. So one example is during COVID. Like, you know, remember that time with the Delta, a lot of people were uh, dying and uh, there was morbidity, mortality, and no one could understand what is happening. So any pandemics, any epidemics, any new world infections that come in, first, we need to understand this black box. That black box is nothing but innate immunity. So what are the innate immune sensors? What are the complexes that are formed? And what are the cytokines that are induced? Because even minute amounts of certain cytokines can induce like 104, 105 fevers. So, uh, and then the cell death will be there. Cell death will release cytokines that will much more modulate in cytokine storm, like umbrella term used by clinicians. There was no definition of cytokine storm and then leading to morbidity mortality. So this block box is what we were trying to understand. At that time, I think uh, the whole entire institute was shut down. So we were reanalyzing patient uh, samples, serum samples, and we were able to uh, pick these top 10 cytokines that are highly upregulated in these patient, COVID patients. Then we made a cocktail of the cytokines and added to cells to see whether they are killing cells or not. Then you can see the cocktail was able to beautifully kill uh, cells and we separated the cytokines. And we found that in this case, TNF together with interferon gamma is killing the uh, killing those cells. And then here you can see TNF alone and interferon alone is not killing cells. By the way, these are every day in and day out. Our bodies produce TNF, you know, upon infections and gamma. So these are all fundamentals, basic information about health and disease. So we are showing that these two cytokines are inducing cell, cell death in mouse as well as in humans. And then now we are asking what is the cell death pathway that is being induced by TNF and gamma. So here it's again, it's not pyroptotic cell death. It is not apoptotic. It is not necroptotic. What is this? I think it's the same complex was involved. Caspase 1, Caspase 8, trip 3 blockade was able to provide protection. And then overall, uh, Raj and Besh were able to publish this study in Cell at the time, showing that the synergism of two cytokines, interferon gamma, and TNF induces this inflammatory cell death, tissue damage, and mortality upon SARS-CoV-2 infection and cytokine storm syndromes. And we're able to also show the complete pathway that these two cytokines engage STAT1. And of all the IRFs, only IRF1 was specifically involved in inducing nitric oxide, forming this multi-protein complex. And once we know the pathway, then we can find therapeutics. So here, Jack, uh, you know, because we know that this pathway, Bartistin got approval at that early stage of COVID to block inflammation. Uh, so once we know the pathway, multiple inhibitors can be designed to, to block these inflammatory diseases. And then for the last part, we talked about infections. We talked about inflammation and how important. And cancer, any cell, if it doesn't die, then only it becomes cancerous. Right. So we should be able to kill those cancer cells. So how can we kill cancer cell? Now we have panoptotic pathway. So can we use this panoptotic pathway to kill cancer cells? So we have these triggers, right? Uh, so we discover TNF and gamma, and then of course influenza virus. We can't use virus to kill cancer cells. So we screened and we found KPT plus interferon. This combination also can kill cells. So can we use these combinations to kill this hard to kill cancer cells? So we did that. We were able to find, you know, we obtained 60 different um, NCI, National Institute of Cancer uh, cell lines from different types of cancers. We were able to show that TNF and gamma can kill all these different cancer cell types. And then um, we also implanted, you know, in mouse and then blocked, gave this TNF and gamma blocking. And then we were able to show, you know, actually cytokines itself injection led to tumor regression. You can see tumor regression here. And then we also identified that IRF1, somehow this IRF1 is uh, amazing that it controls. If you don't have IRF1, there's more tumor burden in colon. You can see all the, the tumors that are forming. And then we also asked this in a, in a interferon nuclear acid in nuclear export inhibitor, whether that can also uh, be used. And uh, long story short, I think here, if you give KPT plus interferon, there's beautiful tumor regression. It's amazing because we can give orally uh, KPT and the interferon low levels of injections can uh, be used. Because historically, for cancer therapy, interferon therapy 
failed. So this combination might be working very well. So and the, the entire big story, Adar one, like you know, it it uh, binds to ZBP one to restrict its function to kill cells. So it's a big story. I don't. I'm not going to go there. So overall. I think we, after identifying ZBP1, we are trying to understand what are the other molecules like ZBP1, and then we found ADR1, and ADR1 restricts ZBP1 mediated, uh, you know, cell death and promotes tumorigenesis. So once we know the importance of these molecules, we can find therapeutics. So so far, it's really you know exciting. We started with ZBP1 panoptosome, which upon influenza infection or nuclear export inhibitor with interferon combination can engage this unique complex. Every single molecule here is proven by IPs. And then upon Francisella or HSV, M2 panoptosome is formed. But if you transfect DNA, DNA alone, then it will be empty inflammasome. But if you give the whole pathogen or combinations, then it will become panoptosome. And then TACI uh, with LPS also, RIPK1 panoptosome is formed. And BALA and Kanan showed heme together with uh, PAMS or TNF can engage NLRP12 panoptosome. And then we still have to find this sensor for TNF interferon gamma pathway. So unknown sensor is involved here. So, so far five different panoptosomes, these multi-protein cell death complexes have been discovered that they induce this panoptosis. And pore forming molecules are there. There could be redundancies in pore forming molecules in, in, in driving this panoptosis. But uh, in our recent study, we showed NINJ1 another pore forming molecule can act as an executioner also for this cell death pathway. So all in all, I think it's fascinating uh, to really understand the biology where you can see, first we started with inflammasomes and then uh, Tenima and Keshav contributed to this GPP1 panoptosome study. And then for AIM2, uh, Siming and uh, you know uh, uh, Sang Jong Lee and then other members they all have contributed using different infection models, inflammatory models, uh, cancer models to understand the biology or to contribute to foundational work that will lead to translational work. Uh, and I have to thank so many collaborators, my mentors and uh, NIH and St. Jude for funding. And uh, with that, thank you all for your kind attention and I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, the complex might be playing. Can, can you repeat? Maybe for uh, people. Yeah. Mm. May lead to more regeneration. That's what the uh, he's saying. It's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and he's right. wondering whether the three mu uh, the triple mutations you have mm. has some more regenerative power as compared to the. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we didn't look into uh, that regeneration, but they're surviving and they're happy. So that definitely they're contributing towards that. That's a great. Uh, that's a great point. Yeah, for example, this one or uh, what can you repeat the model? So, very good. What's your question? This one, this one, this one. Okay, this is fine. This is good. Yeah. Previous one. Like here, you are mentioning man, these three, let's say, safety one, uh, it came one and repeatedly gas this state. So, these all are happening together. So let's say apoptosis. No, 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 no. It's only one pathway, not all are happening. They're different, different pathways. So, there's a sensor. And sensor is forming a complex, one complex, which is panoptosome. One pathway, which is panoptosis. That's it. There are no other pathways here. So caspase, for example, here, caspase 8 will have a unique role in apoptosis differently. It's doing its job separately. But upon influenza infection, this is the complex that is formed. Pathways. It's only one pathway assembling molecules. So 
previously assigned to different pathways doesn't mean that there are multi purpose molecules you know yeah 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 it's not a combination of three pathways it's not a combination of any uh, it's it's uh, one sensor forming a complex protein protein interactions whichever uh, you know is available in that particular cell for example immune cells versus non immune cells uh, some might not contain rip1 other might contain rip3 so depending on that they form these complexes yes Um, you're talking about inflammasomes or panoptosomes, uh, and the question is again, could you please? Say like, say no, like this acute of immune cell is not persistent, which might lead to later on to autoimmune conditions. So it, it depends on infection. Like you know, as we discussed, its initial phase. As soon as there is a pathogen, uh, the cell death will happen, inflammation will happen, and it will it usually gets resolved. So if it doesn't get resolved, then it leads to autoinflammation and other things. So in normal case scenario, it should be resolved. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. In a model for immune condition, mm -hmm. And second question is that uh, recently I have completed this NLRP twelve paper. We do like uh, check whether this NLRP will be with or separate? So ZPP1 is not involved in uh, heme plus TNF or heme plus PAMP induced pathway. Okay. And same thing, NLRP12 is not involved there. ZPP1 is not involved here. So they're unique sensors for unique pathogens or pathogen damp combinations. Could you please? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what your other question is? In metabolic disorders? So in uh, metabolic disorders. So it's known to be involved. LRP3 is known to be involved in metabolic disorders. Uh, 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 that's why they're getting MCC and type of molecules. But which metabolic disorders and the like, uh, you know, strength of uh, issues that are there and which metabolites are being sensed, it's an entirely very interesting field. Not much is known about uh, the metabolite sensors, you know, uh, innate immunity sensing metabolites is not really known. There should be sensing, you know, excess glucose, excess, uh, like excess amino acids, which type, it's all again, a very fascinating area. Or there is interconnectedness already here that we do not know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I think uh, it it must and should be involved because uh, it, it releases all these antigens. You know, depending on the strength of cell death, the antigen load will be there. So so depending on antigen load, uh, T cell exhaustion. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that will happen. So. Again, it's a wide open field. Not much is known about the interconnectedness uh, between innate immunity, cell death, and adaptive immune responses. In cancer immunotherapy, it's a, it's a really hot area now. People are trying to identify why tumors, uh, tumor microenvironment is becoming so resistant uh, because of maybe you know antigen load. Uh, it all depends on the virus. So, you know, each virus, as we discussed, they all are very unique. They are smarter uh, and depending on the lifestyle, uh, they will exploit. So uh, inflammation that in certain cases is good to clear infection. But then uh, if it's too much, it's very bad. So which pathogens, which viruses can lead to the hemolytic diseases or uh, like, you know, most and most abundance of uh, these PAMs and DAMs or cytokines in the system? 
uh, also it depends on exposure like you know it, so lots of conditions different pathogens exposure amounts length of exposure condition i mean uh, intrinsic uh, ge genetic predisposition other diseases yes uh beyond cell death they are involved in for example uh, cytokine maturation we don't need cell death for iron beta maturation uh it's it's all in all i think pretty much first pathogen specific or damp pam specific If been checked whether just like these sensors, there are other things that tell the immune system that these yeah. are part of the native flora. Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, uh, you know, we would have been uh, surviving. I guess there is nice separation of microbiome. I think colon nicely separates and keeps there, and there the immune system is very unique and different than the rest of the body. So yeah, it's it's uh, helping us so that we are not alert uh, because of microbiome. Yes, absolutely. So then again, there, which sensors are uh, shut down, which sensors are polarized, you know, we do not know a lot happens there. So. Uh, ZBP1 is not involved in this case because heme is a specific PAMP that is inducing LRP12. Um, so what conditions, how much of hemolysis happens, it all like different, uh, different infectious diseases, different conditions will lead to that. So again, it depends on uh, the context of that particular disease. Most viruses do not induce hemolysis, but certain viruses, they do. So... Yeah, so innate lymphoid cells, I think they're very few in numbers and they come in pretty much towards adaptive immune responses. So what do they possess I and mean, do they contain sensors? We do not know. So we are pretty much looking at innate immune, cell, uh, innate immune cells here. So macrophages, neutrophils, you know, like, uh, but other T cells also might, like uh, there are pub publications suggesting that T cells do have the sensor molecules and innate like, like ILCs might have also. What is their function there? We do not know. Thank you.